Hello again, Art History 2. I hope you're doing fantastically well. Today, um, greetings from the city of Bruges, and this is actually the Jean Van Eyck um, Square in Bruges, where Jean Van Eyck himself, that great Renaissance artist, had both his studio as well as his home. Um, today, we'll be spending a good amount of time actually talking about Jean Van Eyck and the wonderful experiences that were taking place. And so let's begin. Um, Northern Renaissance art. As I mentioned actually in my classes before, one of the things that I wanna make sure that you know is that I do not care about specific dates for particular artworks. I generally do not see the value in something being five, 10, 12 years different than some of the other artworks. What I do want you to know is be able to place these in a cultural context and a cultural perspective. So I would like you to know the dates for Northern Renaissance art and the artworks that are Northern Renaissance. And the dates then are from 1350 to 1550 CE. Again, we are going to use the word CE or the, the abbreviation CE for common era rather than AD Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Even though we're mostly looking at Christian Western influences, by using CE, the entire world has agreed that they will actually use the CE moniker um, short abbreviation then so that we don't have to adjust for the Muslim cal calendar and add 632 years on top of this for uh, a Muslim world, if you're ever there and seeing, or in the Chinese calendar, changing it by 2,400 years, we're all gonna use the same calendar. Fortunately, because Christianity basically has been the dominant world religion, making up one third of the world's religion today, that 1350 to 1550 CE is the same as 1350 to 1550 AD. We are using the, the Jesus basically, uh, um, aligned calendar, but we're actually calling it the common era, so we'll all agree. All right, where in the world is the Northern Renaissance? Probably most of you know where Italy is, and we'll be talking about the Italian Renaissance for the next two weeks. But before we get there, we want to talk a little bit about the Northern Renaissance. Now, the individuals in the Northern Renaissance believe they invent the Renaissance. The people in Italy believe they invent the Renaissance. And the truth is, it's basically a a cultural zeitgeist milieu which is taking place in the entire area of Europe that is actually going through this, particularly in the more wealthy trading centers that show up. The two major areas in the Northern Renaissance we have to be familiar with, one is going to be this area right up here. This area is called Flanders, and as you can see, it accompanies Belgium and Netherlands, and this is where the city of Bruges and later on, we'll be looking at the Ghent Altarpiece. Both major art projects are imported in the life of Jan van Eyck and his brother Hubert. Um, the Eisenheim Hallmark Altarpiece then, which we'll see later on by Matthias Grunewald, comes from the area down here, Burgundy. Now, Burgundy is France, right here is Paris, so it's right on the French and German border, right here. And one of the most beautiful towns right outside this area is Colmar, if you ever have a chance to actually go and visit Colmar. It's considered the Venice of France. It's a tiny little gorgeous German French influenced town um, that actually has the Eisenheim altarpiece in their local uh, museum there. Now, when we look at this, we have to ask why did Renaissance art develop in the Northern Renaissance? And one of the major things is that the guild industry is going to actually take off during the time period. Remember in the medieval art, we talked about the guilds and the impact of the guilds. And here I wanted to show you from Antwerp, Belgium, one of the most famous kind of guild hall. You see these triangular roofs that are surmounted by some object here. They'll generally have a little logo that looks just like this on the front. Those were actually the headquarters of guilds. And so they actually were generally right in the middle of the city. Oftentimes there will be a major um, cathedral at one end and then these line the streets on the way there. So they form kind of a, a public square of the public area, kind of like Fortune 500 companies that show up. So this one here, as you can see, the, wheel, the wool guild emblem. And that is because wool is what's going to dominate the market um, in Northern France, particularly, or in Northern Flanders, particularly in Antwerp and places like Bruges. And so here we actually have a sheet that's ready for shearing, just to show you how much wool comes off. Now, during the time period, remember, this is a review, hopefully, from Artistry One. If you did not have Artistry One, then this will be slightly new information. Everyone that actually wants to be a craftsman within the medieval world and the Renaissance world has to join a guild. And so, for example, if you want to join um, the Doctor's Guild, 
the doctor and the painters have the game, same guild. Why? Because they're using chemicals and those chemicals are very much the same. The painter's guild just to be, happened to be those chemicals that are brightly colored. The guilds controlled all business and trade in town. You could not trade or be a businessman in town without joining the guild. The guilds also make it expensive. And so men generally have to save their money and save their pennies for quite um, a long time, sometimes 10, 15, 20 years, depending on how successful they are, to join and be an official member of the guild, where it might be $15,000 to join. The power and the wealth of the guilds eventually are what bring feudalism down, and that's why we moved into the Renaissance. And all members, as I mentioned, had to be a member of a guild. And you can think of the guild as a union. What they're going to do, they're going to guarantee the quality of the products coming out because there's an entire guild training system where you start off as an apprentice, as a young boy, and it is boys, no girls are allowed. As a young boy, you slowly learn the guild, you learn the craft, and you become a journeyman. But basically, you are making your way in the world just barely, still under the tutelage of a master, until you create a masterwork, in which case you can open up your own guild. You can equate this very roughly to the use of um, kind of art school, where particularly if you started off an art school in middle school with some kind of talent or interest that you had, you pay the master, really, even in terms of the college and the university, at the end of your bachelor's, then you're ready to strike out on your own as the journeyman to try to figure out, even though you probably don't have perfect art skills yet, and you still need to develop the masterwork. The masterwork would be exactly that. It's your master's thesis. And at the end of that, then you are ready to go on. The guild system is very similar to that. Now, as we look at um, Erasmus, this is an, a picture of Erasmus. It was actually done by the very famous Renaissance artist, um, the same Renaissance artist that actually depicted um, Henry VIII, Hans Holbein, that we'll see later on. Erasmus' impact on the world is the following. Now, remind you, he publicizes the, these ideas that are out there during the time period. He does not invent the milieu or the zeitgeist of what's going on already. Those were the Renaissance thoughts that had already been there. Note, because the Renaissance began long before Erasmus lived. He believes that and wants to promote the idea of change from a medieval mindset of a God-centered universe to a human-centered universe. He literally does want to believe that God is still the hierarchy, but that we should have more of a humanist, uh, a way that we behave and interact with one another should be much more about us. So much less God-fearing than we've seen in medieval art and uh, in medieval ages, and much more of a God-loving, all-accepting, giving us, giving us the, the gift of, of knowledge and the gift of our brains to be able to actually rationalize and think about things that he put into place, God put into place. That's gonna lead us to our second thing, which is a belief in empiricism. Empiricism, if you've ever heard the pure empirical method or the scientific method, is on the verge of being born here. And it's the study of human experiences as truthful. That if you were to go and boil an egg in Bruges and then boil an egg in Venice, they're gonna boil roughly at the same time and for the same amount of time and at the same temperature. So we're going to start developing scientific instruments during this time period that are we're going to record this. Even when we get to um, the Renaissance thoughts of Leonardo da Vinci, he's going to invent anatomy, um, with something which we really hadn't had before, what the human body works or looks like on the inside and how it functions. And finally, we're going to have humanism, that we are humankind is God's highest creation. We're worthy of respect. We're going to see all these elements played out in art. So let's walk through each of these. Changing from a mind, medieval mindset of a God-centered universe to a human-centered universe. Well, one of the ways along those lines is we have to figure out how our human interactions impact the world around us and other people around us. It used to be believed during the medieval age even that God, God caused a plague to punish sinners. And then we start to figure out, oh, well, we, if we wash our hands, if we're more clean, if we get rid of the rats, we have less plague. Ah, oh, there's a correlation. It's not necessarily God. It might be our own filth. And it's going to take us many hundreds of years to rebuild an aqueduct system and another giant plague, actually, in this case of cholera in London, to figure out it's clean running water. We've lost that from ancient Rome. Number two, we're going to have a belief in empiricism, a study of the human experiences as truthful. And, and so in a lot of these paintings, they are going to take years and years and years. And part of that is they're going to try to get actual species that show up. So, for example, in one of the great artworks that we're going to look at later on today by Jan van Eyck, 
the portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife, they just don't put a dog. It's an actual specific dog and species we can identify that wealthy people used to own called an Anfen pincher. If we go back and we look at this lovely image, image called La Primavera by Botticelli, which we'll see next week, there are 40 different identifiable plant species, all here that women used to wear and use almost like perfume. And we will see those different species all within here. They are identifiable. And finally, humanism. Humankind is God's highest creation and worthy of respect. We are going to start looking in Leonardo da Vinci in the South is going to invent the Vitruvian man, which is material world about beauty, but not about sin. That really we can actually start to categorize the beauty because God gave us the logic and the mind in his own image to be able to make those things. And so we are going to invent all sorts of humanistic type subjects, both the humanities and the social sciences, such as anatomy, uh, economics, poli sci, botany we're going to start categorizing the earth again and in the christian image we're going to see this later on we're going to start seeing what's called christus patiens or the suffering christ that very much emphasizes the humanity of christ and how we would suffer rather than the christus triumphons the individual of the the dead christ that's all calm in the spear bearer contrapposto pose where it looks like he just fell asleep and god has raised him up so a very different interpretation of the Christian cross and crucifixion, which we have not seen yet. If we look at this particular artwork, which is often thought of as a self-portrait, and there is some debate on whether it actually is a self-portrait, this is Man in a Red Turban by Jan van Eyck from the 1430s. So what I would like you to do is spend a moment, and as you look at this image by van Eyck, tell me, is this a change from a medieval mindset of a God-centered universe to a human-centered universe? And if so, how? Does this show the belief in empiricism, the study of human experiences is truthful? And if so, how? And finally, is this humanism? Humankind is God's highest creation and worthy of respect. And once again, if so, how? And I'll pause for a moment and then we'll run through what some students have said. Well, it clearly is human centered. And that is because this is a businessman. <clears throat> Excuse me, he's the central focus. There's no religious symbolism that shows up any, anywhere. There is empiricism. There are signs of his age, including wrinkles and skin blemishes. It's not idealized. It's much more like the Roman veristic portraits. There is humanism. This is a middle-class self-portrait. Again, with no underpinnings of the Christian church, not even a cross, wearing a fur coat, and so this is a man uh, about his business, about himself. Again, the idea of humanism. A lot of the Northern Renaissance also deals with classicism. Now we're gonna see way more explicit classicism when we go south to Italy. And specifically remember, classicism is the rebirth of the Greek and the Roman world, the Greco-Roman world. And from their perspective, that's their ancestors. The North, this is not necessarily the ancestors. A lot of these areas were never dominated or controlled by the Romans. And so the bonus is classicism. There is Greek and Latin written on the frame honoring these earlier cultures. So we do still get a shout out to those great early humanist cultures that developed basically Greek humanism. So when we look at Northern Renaissance as art and aesthetics, the stylistic features that make one time period look different than another, you should write these down and have these. These are something you'll have to memorize for your exam as we're going through. And remember, Northern Renaissance goes from 1350 to 1550 in France, a little bit of Germany, um, and the Netherlands up north. And so we're looking at Fla uh, Flanders um, as we're looking at these. So when we're looking at this, the concepts that are going to show up more often than not are transitioned from a Christian world to a real world, the humanist world that we all live in. That's the fundamental underlying concept that we see in most of the artwork. Whether that is a crucifixion with the suffering Christ, whether that is a portrait of a business individual, whether that is even showing a Christian religious figure that, that is going through other suffering or real life battles. The features or the aesthetic features that we see that identify Northern Renaissance from other parts of the world are the following. We're going to have the idea of empiricism, the scientific observation that will take these um, and the details years to create. Humanism, the celebration of us as God's highest creation worthy of respect. 
we are also going to see a lot of middle class patronage. We have an explosion because of the guild with people with newfound money, and they're using that newfound money in artistic ways to decorate their house or to have portraits of themselves to celebrate themselves as powerful figures. Remember, the very cheap version of this, which is photography, is not around for another 400 years. We are going to perfect oil painting, and Jan van Eyck is often given his credit, and everything is symbolic, and that is important. When we look at a Renaissance painting, particularly in the Northern Renaissance, they don't miss a beat. If there is a dog, that dog is important. The species of the dog is important. If the dog is closer to the woman, it matters. If the dog is turning away from the woman, it matters. If that dog is going outside, it matters. And lastly, we're very sh briefly going to see elements of classicism from the Greco-Roman world, but really we're gonna see that as gonna be a dominant feature. And so what you're looking at here is the um, open version of the Ghent altarpiece. So we have to talk about an altarpiece by Hubert, Note his name is very small down there because he did only portions of it. The real credit here goes to Jan van Eyck, particularly with the new innovations. So we have to ask, what is an altarpiece? An altarpiece then, the definition up here, with our lovely Gregorian chants in the background, an altarpiece is a work of art that appears on the most religious part of a church, the altar, where priests and bishops speak. So if you remember from your Gothic cathedral lecture in Art History 1, that is going to be, if Jesus is on the cross, and we have a Latin cross church like we do have here, that's going to be the area where Jesus' throat and vocal cords are. So it's where the priest is. The altarpiece is usually a cross, as I'll show you, but we can have all sorts of other altarpieces. So this is the Ghent altarpiece, one of the most famous altarpieces in the world, in its closed version. And note, it shows you at the very top an enunciation. Very wealthy donors would actually donate the altarpiece to the church, and it was basically every time you would see, you say, "Oh, I understand. This was from the very holy, wonderful business people in our town," and you would actually cite their names. As it said, the most common thing where you would look at is a crucifixion, which makes sense. It's the most common image. So some very famous crucifixions. Now this is the Ghent altar piece, of course, it's there as well with the nativity. But we do have the Copi du Marcavaldo, um, a beautiful crucifixion that shows up from kind of proto-Renaissance, the end of the medieval period. Over here, we're going to see the Eisenheim altar piece with that suffering humanist Christ. And later on during the Northern Baroque period, which is the next period after this, we're actually going to see the beautiful Rubens um, raising of the cross. Now, an altarpiece is an interesting feature because there are multiple pieces of wood in an altarpiece. If you look here, here's one piece of wood here that ends here, and there's one piece of wood that ends here, and then there's a backing that's this entire thing. So they're folding. So you have a piece of wood, a piece of wood, and a backing, and they open up. The vast, most of the days of the year, it's the closed altarpiece. And so the closed altarpiece is what you see here. It's almost like a window door. You see this 300 days out of the year. And they only open it five days a year on the high holy days to show you the interior. And that would be on Xmas, um, Easter, um, the idea of the epiphany. And that is to encourage attendance on those five days. You get a different view that you just can't walk in and see any other time period. So these are the open, open and the closed versions of the Ghent altarpiece by Jan van Eyck and Hubert. Now, I'm going to exit out of this for a moment, only so that we don't listen to the Gothic music as it over kind of laps what I'm saying the entire time. And I'll cut back. You can see the beautiful town of Ghent behind me again. And we're going to share this out. There we go. Now, with the lovely Ghent altarpiece, when, when it's closed, you'll note when you walk in, this is what you see 300 days out of the year. Here you'll see the Annunciation, which we talked about um, in Art History One, where we talked about the main stories in the Christian context that you're going to see. So here is the Virgin Mary right here, dressed, of course, in virginal white, one of the symbols, while the angel Gabriel carries a beautiful lily here, which is a symbol of Mary's purity and comes down. You don't know, the holy dove gently kisses her, and that is her becoming pregnant then with Jesus, with God's son. And so 
a, a real wonderful selection that shows up in a beautifully designed aspect, much more realistic, naturalistic than we've seen in anything that was proto-Renaissance, even of the Giotto at the end of the Gothic period from Art History One. The odd part about this, and for at least from a modern day perspective, is look underneath. We do have lovely donors. And so we have John the Baptist here and John the Evangelist, the two Johns here. And each of these are the patron saints then of the donors. But note, the donors then not only get to say that they paid for it, they get their actual portraits shown. And so these are the two shown here. So the figures are too large for the room. Look at that. If they stand up, they would actually be oversized. And so it kind of recalls Flemish decoration. But look, if they stand up, these donors, they're more important than the Virgin Mary. If we look at scale and hieratic scale, they would be much more taller. So this is really on some level something that you're focusing on here. So it's basically saying the nativity, let's see if we can get to go to the next one for the donors. It's basically saying the nativity is brought to you by Bob and Mary, the names of the two donors. I bought Jesus's nativity blanket at Bob and Mary because Bob and Mary had a shop. And so you would go out and you would actually probably shop more likely at Bob and Mary because look what they did. They used their money for Christian good. So why wouldn't you help them within the process? And that's largely what we're seeing here. And again, so I'll try to do this again. We'll try to reset that so we don't hear the music the entire show. Let's hope that's not set up for that. And we will look at the open version. Now the open version, one of the very strange things which we've recently discovered um, there's still some controversy about this in the literature, but if you look at the facial features here, this appears to be Jan van Eyck as a model for God. It kind of takes some chutzpah to put yourself as the model for God, and yet that's what we think we're seeing. Here's the Virgin Mary, and over here we have lovely St. John the Baptist again, where he's going to be carrying, in both cases, books for the higher education rate. The Northern Renaissance very much appeals to themselves. Note you'll have Adam and Eve, the first humans, which the idea of the perfection of Christianity, but their sin, particularly notice at, um, Eve is the one holding the lovely apple, which is probably not really an apple, but a pomegranate. It's her sin, and it's women that are blamed. But no, right above her are her children and Adam's children, Cain and Abel, committing the first murder. So her infidelity to God about eating from the, uh, the fruit of knowledge, the tree of knowledge, actually leads directly to the, the death of her own children. So she's being blamed here again. At the very bottom, you're going to have a apocryphal scene, which we don't have anywhere in the Bible, but it's the sacrificial lamb and wine, where you have this very highly detailed, if you get up close, this is basically the communion of saints, where all the saints come together throughout history basically as a Christian reference, almost like they're in heaven, um, to honor the sacrificial, here we have lamb and wine. And so with the lamb holding the cross with a cup for the chalice, that you will be the, or Christ will become the body and blood for communion during the Roman Catholic Church. This image is so powerful that the art was used as meds. So they would actually, doctors during the time period, remember we're just developing anatomy, so our understanding of the human body is not very good. If you got bubonic plague, we'd say you should go see the Ghent Alterance and maybe you'll get healed. It's a major problem because if you have the bubonic plague, that means that you are wandering into a very popular, very populous city, bringing the bubonic plague with you. We generally recommend stay away from people when you're sick. This was the best medicine to actually make you survive. I remember from Art History 1, the bubonic plague is awful. The kill rate is about 91%, and you are contagious three days before you see the bubos, even if you're feeling miserable. And so by the time you get there, unless you're really close, you're probably dead on route, but you have spread the bubonic plague to the next town. It was not a very hospitable way of going. This artwork later on is going to become very famous not just for the artwork itself and what it does, but this is one of Hitler's favorite artworks. In fact, it has been 
reason without definitive historical proof but reason that hitler actually invaded the town of ghent and and belgium not because he really wanted belgium because he wanted this piece and he did take it he wanted to build a great art museum in the world called the Führer museum this is a model it was never built and he wanted this to be the opening panel the opening artwork that everyone would see before you actually walk into the main museum this would be in kind of the main area as you're coming in to buy tickets and with the cafe and the bookshop before you walked in to see all the great artworks. He thought this was the, the epitome, the, the high cultural element in Western European thought, at least in art. This artwork becomes so famous that people start dressing up like the characters in Jan van Eyck's artwork. And so it was Christian cosplay Renaissance style. So you could imagine when certain political leaders would come in to see your lovely altarpiece and your lovely church, you as a townsperson to honor your town would dress up like the Virgin Mary or like God enthroned. Again, based upon what famous artwork from Greco-Roman world. This is going to be the hand gesture that comes out of. Very good, the Augusta Purple Porta. And the body sitting, that's exactly right. It's the um, Temple of Zeus sculpture at Olympia. And so that's what we, so we have basically pagan reference that are even showing up with God's head. But you would dress up like the characters and you would actually come out and play Christian cosplay. That's how powerful Jan van Eyck's work had become. Now, one of the things that shows up during this time period is that, and we said this within one of the factors to tell the difference between potentially medieval art, which you see on the right, and oil painting in Renaissance and later art on the left, uh, this is a Rubens from the Baroque period, not from the Renaissance period, is tempera versus oil painting. And for those of you that have actually painted in tempera and in oil, what are the differences? Okay, one is going to be the drying time, as you can see here. Tempera paint dries in a matter of hours or minutes. It's an egg yolk base, so you use egg yolk, and so it's very sticky. Uh, it's also very um, opaque. So you don't see through it. Um, so you get very um, accurate colors for what you're placing on, but very flat colors. Whereas oil paint, because you have multiple times to, to make it dry, um, and literally oil paint, depending on how humid it is, um, could take two to three weeks to actually fully dry. So you have a lot of time to make changes, which you don't in tempera, which means the creativity can go up, which means many more bright colors much more blended and glazing. You could put one layer of paint over another. And the beautiful part of oil paint is that the oil paint is often translucent, which means that if you put a red underneath a blue, you'll get little shimmers of red, more blue clearly, but little shimmers on red because the light goes through all the way to the back of the painting and then goes back through all the layers of painting. When you look at tempera, it goes to the tempera and right back to your eye. And that's all you see. So if you overpainted or painted something over something underneath in tempera paint, it won't matter at all. And so here is how oil paints are created. To show you the new technology that has emerged. And all artists would go through this process. That's why they often had individuals that Traditional would actually help them process. From a simple combination right, you'd have ingredients. students that would help you make this. The material that glues the colored particles to the canvas or panel. In oil paint, the binder is a drying oil, a fluid that absorbs oxygen from the air and becomes a solid film over time. The most common drying oil was flax oil, usually called linseed oil. It was pressed from the seeds collected from the flax plant, like those shown here. The same plant was used as the source of, for the fibers used to make linen canvases. Here's a sample of linseed oil. The other ingredient is the pigment. This is an insoluble powder which provides the color to the paint. Pigments were derived from a number of sources. Historically, a large percentage of pigments were made by grinding natural earths containing iron oxides. Here we see a lump of red earth and red earth pigment made from a similar sample. Other pigments were made from ground up minerals, simple chemical reactions, and even from extracts from plants and bugs. This engraving from around 1600 shows a painter's studio in the early 17th century. A detail depicts the artist's assistants preparing oil paint. Here we see red earth being placed on a granite slab. A little linseed oil is then added in increments. It's important to add only enough to create a stiff, barely workable paste. 
Excess linseed oil will cause the resultant paint to become yellow-brown over time. The quantity of oil needed to make a good paint differs with each color depending on pigment size, morphology, and chemical reactivity. This makes it difficult to simply follow formulas for the small-scale production of paint. Additionally, the paint maker may want to make a paint of a specific consistency for a particular painterly effect. This stiff paste is then worked with a muller to fully disperse the pigments into the linseed oil binder. Slabs and mullers were originally made from granite or porphyry. Glass mullers and plates were used later. Today, oil paints are made in large industrial roller mills. The paste of pigment and oil must be mulled for many minutes before it becomes a usable paint. The paint maker needs to continue to And so for every color that you wanted to paint, this is what you would have to go through and find a way of storing it so it didn't dry out over the next couple of days. So you had the same color you could apply. As the paste is worked, it loosens up and becomes more glossy. So the more colors, then, the more valuable, the more expensive a painting was even to make. The paint maker may find that the paint is too loose and additional pigment needs to be added and mulled again. Or it may require a touch more oil to be just right. Each pigment will also create a paint with individual physical characteristics. Some are short and buttery, while others are long and runny. This video was created for the Art Conservation Department at the University of Delaware. I'm Assistant Professor Brian Boddy. Now, once you actually have created your paint, you are actually going to do a sketch, um, and generally a very detailed sketch. And because you know what sketching is, I'm not going to actually um, show you a sketch, but a very detailed sketch so you can get the accuracy right. Once that is done, then you do an underpainting. And so here is a video talking about the difference between doing an underpainting and not doing an underpainting. Hey everyone, and thank you for joining me today. So I wanted to make a video about the subject of underpainting. I get so many questions about this and I figured it would be best to just make a video, explain it more in depth rather than typing it out all the time. This is something that you see a lot of artists doing with paint, myself included, particularly in the oil painting process. Um, it's a technique in oil painting where you take an earthy tone like burnt umber or burnt sienna, raw umber, um, and you dilute it with paint thinner. In my case, I'm using Gamsol, which is a much cleaner odorless mineral spirit. I basically use the paint thinner with my oils, and it's almost like the consistency of watercolor. So I create this monochromatic image, which is layer one of my painting, and it's a very, very thin layer of paint. It evaporates very fast, so it tends to be dry to the touch pretty quickly, and it's not gonna muddy up your colors. So what is the purpose of doing this? If it's going to get covered up anyway, why even bother? Why not just sketch your outlines in pencil? Well, I like to think of this underpainting as the Renaissance like artist did both. of the painting, which is, you know, the foundation that you build on. For me, it's basically a pre-sketch where I map out where everything will go. I can establish the tonal values right from the beginning of the painting, which allows me to start painting with light paint. Unlike with a blank white canvas, you're working with strictly highlights, and every color you paint with on that blank white canvas is going to be darker than the background. I like to have the option of the paint I'm putting down to be lighter than the background. So just for an example, I have to my left a surface that has been toned with burnt umber. And to my right, I have a surface that is just blank. It's plain white. So I'm just demonstrating here how different the colors can look between the toned and the white canvas. Which do you personally prefer? Do you like to only work with shadows because the canvas is blank? Or do you like to be able to also work with highlights because the background is a little bit darker? It's honestly up to you to figure out which way you like to paint. For some people, but Renaissance artists like the realism of being able to use earth, both highlights others, and shadows, and that's why there's always an underpainting. Sometimes paint. I wouldn't even map out the painting. I just tone the canvas and grid it, possibly, and immediately go in with color. I tend to switch around my map. So that's one of the reasons why. And then once you get going, you actually start painting. And for an oil painting, one of the great things about it is you can glaze it at the very end, which makes a painting glow. So here's a video that actually quickly talks about the glazing. You'll note all the steps we saw earlier will also be here. I'm Will Kemp from Will Kemp Art School, and I'd like to introduce you to this new portrait course, How to Glaze an Oil Portrait for Beginners. Glazing a portrait is the simplest way to achieve a realistic turning of the form, 
by building up translucent veils of color and multiple layers. Note of the realism and the naturalism that comes out of this. Underpainting. So that was the underpainting so they're going to build up. In very simple stages. When they're all combined together, you create this complex luminous skin tone that can't be achieved when you're just working with a opaque paint alone. In this course, we study two different portraits using two different color palettes. We start with a simple pencil composition, blocking in the planes of the face with clean flat tones. And this really helps to develop the form of the grid's eye underpainting. We then mix mediums based on the fat over lean approach using traditional and modern recipes before progressing on to mixing color strings of natural skin tones. We'll build up translucent veils of skin tone followed by multiple layers of transparent glazes. In each stage, you'll gain a practical understanding of how to build up a modeling of the form in really simple steps. And this is a well, process that was developed by Jan van Eyck and Leonardo da Vinci. Realistic portraits and have a great understanding of how you can utilize glazing in your own portrait practice. And the amazing part about glazing then is as you're looking at a particular portrait, as we can see here, what you see is you see all those flesh tone colors underneath because the light, it's a transparent layer of paint. So the light goes through every layer. So every flesh tone, when it comes out, you see a blending of all of those different colors that are shooting out back to your eye. So it's a remarkable accomplishment what you can do. This is one of the reasons this technique, as well as the empiricism to get all the details right, is why Renaissance art sometimes takes three, four, five years to make an artwork. It's also why you have an apprenticeship system and why they are so expensive. The apprentices are actually doing a lot of the underpainting. They're doing a lot of the shading. The master is overseeing them, but then we'll put on the finishing touches, particularly on faces, but also approve all of the color development as it's coming up. That's what the master does as you're in the guild system. And so when we look at this and kind of the individual who's considered the master of this, his name is Jan van Eyck. We already looked at the dense altarpiece by him. We know very little about his personal life. We generally don't know a lot about the personal lives of artists. It was not of consequence until right about this time period when the first art historian starts documenting them. But he lives in Italy, not in northern, um, up in Flanders. And so we don't see it much from here. Um, he's mistakenly credited with inventing oil painting by the first art historian. His name was Vasari. He does not. He revolutionized painting, though, by combining symbolism and naturalism, like with the details that we've been seeing. And he's famed for his humanist and his portraits, his humanism. The idea of this, this really looking at this complex, beautiful issue that it looks like a real human individual that really existed. It is a very veristic or like the Roman true self-portrait. He also includes unflattering details. He doesn't ephibize them or ephibistic, make them more beautiful. His very favorite subject is to do Virgin Marys, which he does larger than life. And it's about half of his, all of his paintings that he does are Virgin Marys. The artwork that we want to consider today is an unusual one. And that is because we want to look at what's called the portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife Senemi by Jan van Eyck from 1434. This is an unusual painting because yes, it has the absolute humanism and empiricism. And we can talk about that later on, but we want to look at the content that shows up here. We need you to determine, because during this time period, there are certain set standards in what you would actually create. And here is one of those standards, one of those uh, paintings that challenges the standards of the time period. You would be very common to have a marriage portrait when you get married. Um, and it would be of the husband and the wife, or it might be two separate portraits, like we believe the Mona Lisa was, without the male portrait that we've ever found or was ever commissioned or ever begun. And so here is a potentially a marriage portrait of the two individuals getting married. But there are some very odd details. Some of the other things that will show up is that this is the power of attorney. So maybe this is a power of attorney. A power of attorney, if you don't know, is when you give up your legal rights to someone when you are off to do business or at the end of life. You know, we talked about the, the pull the plug that if you are a, in a vegetative state with your brain, do you really want to be revived? If it's either, if it's for both, if it could be either marriage or power of attorney, it's going to be both. 
And if it's neither, meaning it supports something else, we need to put that in. Remember, everything in this painting is symbolic. So the power of attorney up here, it's a legal contract where you give your rights like business contract rights to someone else or medical consent to another person. You know, a woman or a wife wouldn't automatically have this power of attorney in a marriage in the Renaissance. They weren't valuable enough. If you have an elderly son or an elder son that was above 16, he might have the rights to be able to do that, but you would have to sign over those legal rights if you were a businessman. So the question is, is this a businessman going on a trip and they're already married, giving him the power of attorney to his wife? Or alternatively, is this a marriage portrait? And I, in class, I gave you an entire one-page sheet of all the different details that show up. Now, anything that shows up within the Christian context, so such as the lighted unity candle that happens to be up here, or the idea of St. Margaret, who this tiny little sculptural detail right here that has to do with Christian authority, they're both legal contracts and Christ's present in the Renaissance was required for both marriage for power of attorney. So neither one of those will hold. So you have to use those details to try to figure out whether this is marriage or power of attorney by labeling it out on the sheet that I gave you in class. And you'll note here, Johann Van Eyck was here. So he actually even signs the painting right in the middle, an unusual signature, but a signature that would show up in either a legal document for power of attorney or potentially for marriage. And so you'll have to come up with, is there more evidence for power of attorney or more evidence for marriage? And I'll give you a couple minutes to do this. Um, the sheet is also available in Blackboard if you miss class today. Now, you can pause this and I'm going to continue on. Of course, you'll be able to see here, there is empiricism, there is humanism, there is classicism. This is middle class portraiture, oil painting nearly perfected here. Everything is symbolic. And so all these different features happen to be here as we're going through. And some of the features then that you talked about, note the complementary colors, the red versus the green the marriage of opposites. That was a very good symbol for marriage, right? You're bringing two unlike things together, the male and the female here. The bedroom is an unusual space for a marriage, but it is a place that where it could take place. I can't say that this is actually the bedroom. Remember the word bedroom hasn't been invented yet. So the word we use here would be a nuptial chamber because Shakespeare has not yet lived or is just beginning to live now in order to give us that word, it's an invented word that shows up. The two witnesses, many people said, oh, well, you need two witnesses for marriage. You will also need to be need two witnesses for a legal document. If you look at the shoes and the dog, note the dog is closer to the woman. Again, probably, and dogs were often given as gifts from men to women during marriage. If the dog is already closer to the woman, they're probably already married. Note the curtains of the, the bed are already open, meaning, They've already had in delecto felecto, they've already actually potentially had sex and consummated the marriage. Is she pregnant? If she's pregnant, this is absolutely a, um, a power of attorney because no man in his right mind at this age is going to marry a woman who was already pregnant, meaning she had a, a, either an affair or she had sex out of wedlock to destroy his business um, acumen, his business savvy that he was running an immoral practice from the Renaissance perspective. Still humanist, but still with Christian undertones, very much so. So that's what we're looking at here. If you determine she's pregnant based upon the fabric here, then you are gonna determine that this is power of attorney. If you determine that she's not pregnant and for somewhere she's really weirdly holding this up in this very awkward pose up on her belly because she's moving to move because of her train of her dress is so long to get to her shoes to go outside, you can conclude this is marriage. So all those different details, please look at that paper. Now, there's another interpretation of this artwork as well. And it might be that the idea of life versus death. This woman actually died potentially during childbirth. Now, this is becoming more and more disproven, but not fully disproven. And so it might be a portrait of, initially was thought of life on one side, and death on the other, really holding that child like so sacredly. We see the same thing in the breakup that shows up along the mirror line here. Where we have life on one side and death on the other. Life note, the window, the oranges, all of these prayer beads, many of the symbols of life over here, the symbols of death, including a lot of saints. And even in terms of over here, we have the crucifixion. Over here, we have the resurrection. 
So it could have been a, a posthumous if the woman had died beforehand. And that is a theory that is still debated. But it's nice to know the different interpretations that show up we try to figure out how all these symbols match up. Now, for all of you, remember, one of the things that I, I want you to do is I want you to learn as much of out of class as you do in class. My in-class lectures should really motivate you, hopefully get you to look at some of the greatest art, artists, artworks that you're going to have to know for the future. And so let's get some class note-taking strategies. You can use these when you're doing your reading and video notes. Remember, I look at your notes for 30% of your final grade, which means you really do have to keep up with your notes from both the readings and the videos. I will only ever look at your notes, specifically as we talked about on day one of class, that are the ones that you are taking outside of class on the artworks. If it's just on an artist, those are notes for you. If it's just on an art historical movement, kind of set the time frame, those are for you. When I evaluate notes, though, when we have a a reading or a video where they really do concentrate and focus on a particular artwork with a paragraph or a couple paragraphs or with a minute or two on the video, I want you to take notes along these lines. And the notes that I want you to take are answering the three questions. Why did the artist make it? Is it religion? Is it politics? Um, was it a personal portrait that they were getting paid for, like Leonardo's uh, Da Vinci's Mona Lisa? Number two, what's new and innovative? This is why things make it into the art history textbook. They are challenging and pushing the human creative potential forward, leading us into the creative exploding world on the internet today. And number three, kind of speculate and try to figure out, because this will not generally be in the book, why is this important? Is this the first time we see a female portrait? Is it the first time we really see oil painting? Try to speculate on why it's important. If you really can't figure it out, it is okay to leave it blank, but you should not be leaving all of them blank, maybe one or two of them. We want you to actually do what we call um, kind of integrative learning. Here's what you know. Now try to figure out why does that make that artwork important from a modern day perspective, even if it's not in the reading. So we're really reflecting upon it. What we know, and this is what I mentioned in class before, is if I were to go back and I would say, um, go up back and read the chapter on Renaissance art and gave you no direction or told you nothing on what I wanted you to do or understand, the vast majority, first off in college, would not read the chapter, which is unfortunate. So, you know, you're taking a college class, we want you to be engaged and on, on some level, but the vast majority, about 70% of you, if I wasn't going to do any testing, 70 to 80% of you wouldn't even crack the book. The 20% of you that do crack the book might not learn that much in the process. Why? Because your human brain can only absorb a certain number of pieces of information at any given time. Don't believe me, go to a party. When you go to a party and you see a cute girl or a cute guy that you're interested in and you ask for their, their number or for the contact information, what you've been talking, imagine they tell you those numbers and you actually have to remember them. Your cell phone for some reason ran out of juice and you don't have it. And so you are going to remember those seven numbers most of us are not going to remember those seven numbers. If we do, we're definitely going to switch them. So we're going to call the wrong person, show up on that first date. And goodness gracious, this is not the person. I have no idea who this was at all. And so we need a way of organizing our thoughts. And that's why when you are in my class, I, I'm going to organize the thoughts for you. We are going to emphasize not necessarily the dates. We're going to emphasize the analytical understanding of why artworks were made and why those artworks are so important to change the world in the future. How does human creativity push the world in new directions to see new things, to understand love, marriage, death, the afterlife in new perspectives? That really is the concentration on the course. Google in the modern day information age or Wikipedia does a fantastic job looking up individual facts. We want to put those facts in context. And so that's the notes that you'll be turning in um, every week, specifically only on the artworks. I highly recommend you take notes on the other things that will actually assuage you and help you um, learn the material, but I'll only ever be looking at those class notes themselves. I'm sorry, those notes outside in the video and in the reading that you do as homework. I'll never look at your class notes. Now, as you are doing class notes, not just in my class, but in other classes, you did have a video this week that talked about taking notes both in and out of class. And there's a, about five different methods that you can do. Most people end up using the outline method, which is the main topic, a subtopic, 
and a thought or a supporting fact that goes along with it. This is generally the one that most people have learned and come down to. But there are other methods as well that might be much, might be much more effective to your future career and make you understand things. My preferred method, I will tell you, is the mind mapping. And that's because I'm a conceptual thinker, as we'll talk about in a moment. So Cornell method, basically you have a note-taking area, basically like this, where you say, why, my, why make the art, what's new and innovative, the impact on the world, the three questions we've got to go over, a Q column, so maybe there's something that, that you remember about a particular artwork that will help you remember other things about the artwork. You know, is there some cool detail that you saw that you thought the artwork is really cool? And then the summary on what the most important part is. That's another way of doing it. Another way is that my PowerPoint presentations are all available for you to use all semester long, as well as this lecture. But in terms of taking your own notes, listening to a lecture over and over is only semi-effective. It's much more when you put it in your own information by writing it down. And I will tell you, from all the pedagogical research out there, the best way of writing down a particular note is actually writing it down on paper. You'll learn 15% more if you write things down on paper and change it than you will actually typing on a computer. Don't know why that is yet, but that is what we were learning in the, the pedagogical method. You can do a flow method, which is you take kind of the main concept and the idea and see what develops out of that main concept. So oil painting, we could talk about Jan van Eyck and the invention and then the glazing, how we had the underpainting, how it shows this luminous glow that's eventually going to give us religious figures like saints and angels that glow because of the glazing techniques. And the preferred method for me is mind mapping. We'll do this a couple of times in classes, particularly as a review material, where you take a main concept and you see all the ways that it relates after you kind of understand the concept. How does it impact creativity, planning, benefits, or anything else within it? So we'll do a couple of these in class within the process. But I highly recommend you take some form of notes because there's so much information coming to you in this class, particularly those of you that are art majors. This will be something that you will have to learn for your future career. You don't imagine that you can always look things up there may might not be time. And if you want a job interview and you're later in the job interview in Disney and they ask you, hey, draw, a, draw a, a, the Roman Colosseum and a battle that would take place there. And you draw Greek impacts, you've just lost that job. And so we want to make sure that this actually gets crystallized in your mind in terms of class note-taking strategies and note-taking strategies at, at home. Note, the last thing, even though it makes up 30% of your grade, the notes that you'll be turning to me that you do in the videos and the readings throughout the term, why made art, why the art was made, what's new and innovative from the artist, and the impact on the world, if we can come up with those. The one thing I want to point out is that the effective way might be putting into grid format, where you have literally, kind of like this, you have a grid where you have one, two, three, question why made art one, what's new and innovative, and you just write it out in a grid. So here's the artwork, here's why it was made, it's politics, it's religion, so it doesn't have to be paragraphed, typed out. It can actually be bulleted, noted, and in shorthand. The, the more it's in your language versus the language of the book or the video, the better. That means you've processed the information, and that will help you learn as well. Okay, so that's kind of my tips on note-taking strategies before we look at our next artwork. And we'll take a quick break. Whew. Look at the beautiful city of Bruges and get kind of re-inspired. This is an artwork that I mentioned before. And so the major inclusion with this, this is a, um, an altarpiece. It's called the Eisenheim altarpiece. This is the Eisenheim lovely church um, right outside of Colmar. This is now in the city of Colmar. And if you go there, one of the nice things, they've removed some the panels so you can see both the open and closed version of this at the same time, which we can do, but not if it's being used as an altarpiece in a church. This is one of those that focuses on the humanism of Jesus. Because for the first time, we have the suffering Christ showing the human life that happens. This is the dark foreboding nature of what you're going to see or what you would have seen in the Eisenheim altarpiece if you showed up during the Renaissance. This very dim, dark, while Christ is on the cross, on some of them, shameful if you've committed sin because he died to help you with your sin and you're wasting away. You actually get the very positive, lovely, beautiful images of the open image of the Eisenheim altarpiece only on the high cold holy Christian days. So if you look at this, this is called Christus Pathians, or the pathetic Jesus Christ. And not pathetic, like that person is pathetic, but the pathetic, the pathos, the idea of the emotion you're supposed to feel 
this is your your you know for if you're christian this is the belief that this individual suffered one of the horrific torturous moments in human history crucifixion is about as torturous as you can get it takes three to four days to die you bleed out you basically asphyxiate it is a terrible terrible way it's disgusting whether it was jesus or anyone else and the romans practiced this to scare people for hundreds and hundreds of years and so here we have sir anthony or saint anthony basically i'm um, over here pointing and John the Baptist, I'm sorry, St. Anthony over here, my bad, or right here. We have John the Baptist right here, points and repeats and saying, he shall increase, basically that his life will go on. We have a ghost-like virgin falling and being supported. We have Mary Magdalene, note with the same torturous fingers that are ripped apart like Jesus up here to show the agony that shows up. On the other side, we have St. Sebastian. St. Sebastian and St. Anthony were both martyred in awful ways. St. Sebastian, we'll see a lot of images of him later on, had arrows shot through him like he was a human pincushion. So he would feel, because they tried not to hit any of the vital organs, so he would suffer. There's a putrescent kind of green and yellow on the very bottom, very bottom of one of these altar pieces. Don't worry about the vocabulary word. Right? Vocabulary word. It's called a padella, and that's a lamentation. And so basically the burial that's going to happen and this is very common because this actually um, hospital, so this was uh, near a hospital that actually used to bury bubonic plague victims. Here we have the Baptist, John the Baptist, and the, beneath it, the lamb holding a cross and bleeding into a chalice, right? The communion that's actually developing here for the baptism and the Eucharist, the other Christian elements. So it's a remarkable piece. This is what you see closed 300 days out of the year. And then in contrast, when you go on the high holy days, this is one of those images that opens up and you see the Christian joy days, five days a week. You have natural daylight versus the closed darkness, these beautiful lights and fires coming up. In the first one, we have the Annunciation again. Marion has virgin symbols everywhere. The enclosed garden back here. Fig trees which bear fruit even when there is no rain and when they're not fertilized, they can fertilize themselves. Here we have the beautiful image of the nativity within this beautiful outdoor setting, not in a manger. And finally, resurrection, showing that all of you can be resurrected because Christ sacrificed for your sin. And so it's the suffering and the, the hands, the putrescent of the, the, the suffering Jesus is the first time we've ever seen it. And lastly, one of my favorite artworks of all time, but man, is this a tough artwork. The first thing we have to ask, is this a Northern Renaissance artwork? Because remember, we have to evaluate it according to Northern Renaissance aesthetics and Erasmus's ideals. So let's start off with Erasmus ideas. What are those three ideas again? Very good, humanism. Excellent, empiricism, that scientific look at the scientific universe. So we should see real um, creatures that we can identify and in a minute detail. And good, uh, changing from a God-centered fearing universe to a God-loving, more gothic and then renaissance universe and the other renaissance aesthetics excellent everything's going to be symbolic good all right middle class patronage okay oil painting and this is oil painting within the process so the question for all of us to take a moment and look at is this actually a northern renaissance artwork and i'll give you a moment to look at that by all means you can pause the video and i'll move on so you can come up with your own conclusion before we ruin the answer to you. It's a good way of practicing thinking. Even when you miss class, you can get the same questions and try to have an idea of how it works. This is a Northern Renaissance artwork, but it's only a Northern Renaissance artwork because the artist lived in the Northern Renaissance. If you look in every other capacity, as we'll see from the details, we're not gonna see a lot of humanism. We're God's highest creation. This is us a sinner and sufferer. This is a Gothic medieval world. The reason why it was done during the Renaissance is basically this is a throwback. My the artwork artist up here called Garden of Earthly Delights is from the year 1500. It's by the artist Hieronymus Bosch. The reason why it was done within this Hieronymus Bosch is largely because there was a bubonic plague outbreak during his lifetime. And so people, you had two ways or three ways really. Number one, you could move towards the Christian church and say, God, please save us. We are trying to do what's right. Please guide us within the process. You could go, wow, you humanists and believing that you are unworthy of understanding God's way 
and God's knowledge and that God is going to grant you rather than fearing God, you're just, there's, there's a problem there. You're probably all going to hell, which means our entire society is going to hell. And number three, turn away from God completely. And this is the individual that basically starts playing and says, we need a Gothic sensibility of God fearing. We need to move. Yes, if you commit all these sins in the middle, you're going to get hell in the end. And so this is a picture basically showing you what happens when you have a good weekend with the seven deadly sins. Lust, envy, wrath, wrath sloth, pride, gluttony, and greed. And so if you look at the sins, you can see there's gluttony as they're eating giant fruit. There's lust as they start to masturbate one another. Um, here you actually have oral sex actually just in public. Here you actually have one of my favorite, don't judge me, a man taking rose petals with roses on, sticking up another man's anus. And note those have thorns on them. And then when you move into heaven, you get those same thing, or heaven. When you move into hell, you get those same torture. So here you have a demonic bird with a witch's cauldron eating and shitting out the individuals. Here you have a woman who, even while she's being raped by this hideous monster, still looks at her face because she, she believes she's so beautiful in this mirror for vanity and pride. Over here you have an individual who, when the tax collector came up, they ate their gold can of coins, and later they're going to have to shut them out. And so this symbol of greed. So this is what we're seeing. This is what you're going to see open. So imagine this is the image on the five holy days. When you walk into church on Christmas, you're not explaining Santa Claus. Luckily, we haven't invented him yet, so we don't have to worry about it. But we are actually looking, and you're going to have to explain this to your children, right? The idea that if you commit these sins and these, you're going to be punished in ultimate damnation, including a self-portrait right here of Hieronymus Bosch with his body in a prostitution house that's been ripped apart with his ears and his horn, um, spectacular ways that's actually demonic. So if this is the case, what would you expect? If this is a depiction of the world, how would you expect it to look when it's closed? That's the closed. Look what a dark and dank world that is. It basically is you trying to avoid sin, right? Look at how bright and fun the sin looks. But you know that if you commit sin, this is where you're going to go to. So instead, it's just a matter of the status quo. I've got to deny myself these pleasures. I've got to make sure I don't do the 10 deadly sins so I get to go to heaven. And look, here is God, basically God up here watching. Not a loving God, a God basically waiting for you to screw up so he can send you to hell. That is a medieval even a Romanesque concept of, of God as the person that needs to inflict pain rather than the all-loving God helping you with a good Christian message. An alternative analysis of this, again, we are trying to match up all the different symbolism. And this alternative analysis, note, could be the same analysis. It just adds another layer on top of it. And so Bosch's family runs an apothecary, which is basically a haberdashery for medicines. And he is a hydraulic engineer. And so a lot of the flasks that are in here basically were distillation equipment. So distillation equipment during the um, time period were actually called marriage flasks, bringing two opposites together, boiling them, mixing them together, you make a new family. And so a new alternative, new analysis for this artwork is creating the elixir of life, basically that idea that prolongs life and goodness. Medicines. So it could be a parable on human salvation in which the process of alchemy Turning useless metals into gold is like turning souls of sinners into spiritual gold, right? And here's how it works. In the idea of conjunction, which is marriage, you have a marriage flask right here. You're bringing opposites together. The birds flying away right here. You'll see birds flying out of the different marriage flasks. That's the process of distillation. Distillation is the idea of getting the purity if it's white, but if it's black, getting the impurities off. The lake is actually called coitus lake from Latin, which means to have sex, which makes sense if you're getting married. Married. Now note, the non-empirical nature of some weird, is that a dingo? Like they did pretty well with the elephant, but that giraffe's got a weird neck. What the hell is this two-legged dog? And you have unicorns, so clearly not empiricism. The next section, reproduction and purification, this is the idea of crossbreeding, transmutation, transforming states, and the upside down figures then, an alchemical text from the time period, let me find one of them, is, oh, here you have, is the idea of showing distillation, turning things inside out. And lastly, the putrefication, the rotting, the, the crap that's end that wasn't distilled, that's not very good, that you just burn off, you refuse in the sins. 
the cornemuse, the bagpipe, that actually they used to use as an air bellow because you pump air in, you actually can make the temperature hotter inside. So that fresh air. And so that's the argument on why the cornemuse, that bagpipe happens to be there. Now, this can be true and it can still be what we talked about before. Um, in fact, they build upon one another. And so that's something that shows up. And so what do you think Christian sin and redemption or outcome of a rebirth? They both can be true. So there's a good argument for both based upon what Bosch knew in his background. Now, before we look at our last kind of a move a little bit up, we want to look at this aspect here. In Miami-Dade College,